Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to American University School of Public Affairs and Policy Autonomous Vehicle Forum. Public policy and regulation will have significant impacts on the widespread use of these vehicles. Transportation is the fourth largest expenditure among American households, with Americans on average spending 15% of their budgets on transportation costs with an average one-way commute of 25.9 minutes. But of course, those of us who live in major cities know it can be significantly more. In addition to the cost of transportation, there's also the inclusion of the cost of goods and services. Widespread use of autonomous vehicles has the potential to greatly reduce the loss of life on our nation's roadways, to ease the stress of the driving task and provide increased access to jobs, food, and healthcare. During the next four panels, we will explore and discover the current state of autonomous vehicles, trucks, personal delivery devices, passenger hail services, or private vehicle. How regulation and policy is impacting the potential widespread use and what public engagement and consumer sentiment might mean in this area. We'll start the discussion with four operators in the autonomous trucking space, Embark, Kodiak, Locomation, and Too Simple, all with a slightly different take on getting us to autonomous trucking. We'll then move later on this afternoon to a discussion on the city-state government perspective. We're fortunate to have a complement of the DMV, representatives from DC government, Maryland state government, and Fairfax city government. They'll be discussing their views as government agencies on the implications and endorsement of autonomous vehicles throughout their communities. Tomorrow, we will move to PDDs, personal delivery devices, namely the delivery robot. We'll be joined by Starship, Neuro, and KiwiBot who all have personal delivery devices operating on roadways and sidewalks in America, providing anything from pizza on a college campus, groceries to neighborhood families, or medicine to those who were sick and shut in. And then last, but certainly not least, we are honored to have Michelle Peacock of Waymo with us. She'll be doing the fireside chat tomorrow afternoon. Michelle is the global head of public policy at Waymo, where they have recently launched driverless ride hail service to the public in Arizona. These panels will be moderated by myself, Salika Talbot. I'm a professorial lecturer here at American University with a background in law, federal and state regulation. And I've written and lectured in the areas of transportation, electric and autonomous vehicle policy. Now I'd like to move forward to the specifics of our panel today, the trucking industry. The trucking industry is an $800 billion a year enterprise with 70% of all freight moved by truck. You look around any space that you're in, 70% of everything that you have came on a truck. In addition, almost 6% of the entire US workforce are in jobs related to trucking with 947,000 professional truck drivers. Truck driving is also the number one job in 29 states in America. But that pool of professional truck drivers is shrinking. The current average age of a professional driver is 55 years old. And the demand for truck drivers is so acute that some say that the industry is short 100,000 truck drivers right now, and that we will need to hire up to 1.1 million new drivers in the next decade just to keep up with demand. <coughs> As a society, we want our goods and we want them now. That coupled with the long over the road, coast to coast, four to six days that it'll take to get goods from one coast to the next, we certainly will need more truck drivers to keep the supply chain moving. Not to mention that each year in the United States, we lose almost 40,000 lives to crashes. 
from safety to speed of goods and a declining workforce, the industry is in need of some radical innovation. And I guess that's where my panelists come in. We have with us Chetan Marichli from Locomation, Dan Goff from Kodiak, Monica Darwish from Embark, and Robert Brown of Too Simple. I'm going to ask the panelists to introduce themselves and explain in general terms what their companies are doing in the area of autonomous vehicle trucking. Chetan, I'll start with you. All right. Thank you so much, Silika, for the wonderful introduction. And it's a great privilege and honor to, to, to share the stage with such a distinguished group of people. I'm Chetan Mirch, the co-founder and CEO of Locomation. Locomation is a Pittsburgh-based uh, company, uh, a full-stack autonomous uh, driving company developing safe and reliable autonomous driving technologies, uh, focusing on semi-trucks. We adopt a phased uh, and product portfolio approach. We will be offering as different flavors of autonomous driving in the upcoming years. And we are starting with what we call autonomous convoying, where we have two trucks basically in a convoy formation with a, a lead truck driven by a human, followed by a self-driving truck. I think that's a, some, I mean, I, and I know we will, we will be uh, elaborating on different parts of that uh, as we go. Hi, I'm, I'm Daniel Goff. Um, I'm the head of policy at Kodiak Robotics. So first, thank you so much to Salika and the School of Public Affairs for inviting me to participate today. Um, Kodiak Robotics is based in the San Francisco Bay Area, but we have our testing and deployment hub in, uh, in the Dallas-Fort Worth area, where we're actually making daily deliveries between Dallas and Houston on behalf of commercial customers. So I think that's that's one thing I think it's, it's um, important to, for this audience to understand is that people generally think of autonomous vehicles as kind of a, you know, a futuristic technology that maybe we'll see in our lifetimes. But actually, I think pretty much all of our companies or all of our companies are actually making deliveries today with, with safety drivers um, in, in the cab of the vehicle. Um, so we have a fleet of about 10 or so trucks, um, and we're taking a bit of a different approach from Chaitan and his team at Locomation. I think it's a little bit more similar to what uh, Monica and Robert's companies are doing. We're building um, basically what, what we call level four, SAE level four, fully driverless um, trucks. So we plan on, on operating single trucks, not convoys, but um, in the next handful of years without drivers and focused on the middle, on middle mile trucking. So basically on a fairly narrow use case of sort of pretty close to the highway and on highways um, and really optimizing our technology around that middle, those middle mile applications. So we can get sort of really good at doing those one thing, that one thing and, and still rely on human drivers um, for first mile pickup and last mile delivery. Um, me personally, I, I joined Kodiak a little over a year ago though, for the year before that, um, I was a consulting firm and Kodiak was a client. So I've been with the company in some capacity, almost since we were found, almost since the beginning, we were founded in in April of 2018. Um, I'm really excited to be here. Um, looking forward to the conversation. Hi everyone, my name is Monica Darwish. Thank you to our host and to the audience for tuning in today. Um, I work for Embark Trucks. We, like Kodiak, are building a self-driving truck that can perform long haul trips on limited access freeways. So like Dan mentioned, that middle mile of on the freeway and short distances off to something like a distribution center. Um, as policy counsel, I bring a legal outlook to our policy work and also work on some internal legal functions. Uh, looking forward to the conversation today. Hey everyone, uh, Robert Brown from Too Simple. Um, Really excited about today's uh, panel and thank you to Salika. Also shout out to my friend Kevin out there uh, on the, as well, uh, the, uh, leading the charge out in DC. Uh, too simple, we got uh, started in 2015. We've been laser focused on trucks uh, like some of my counterparts here. 
on that level four middle mile, uh, working you know, from large distribution center to large distribution center. Uh, I think your you know, big UPS facilities you see off I-10, um, or in your guys' case, you know, 395 to, a, to, an, to another one. Um, and, and that's how that we see the, the relative near future. Uh, working with folks like UPS, uh, our OEM partner Navistar, uh, and building out that truck for the future. So excited to, to talk policy, talk workforce, and all the things that uh, autonomous vehicles bring uh, in the relative near future. So thank you. Thank you, Robert. And thank you all for being here. Well, let's dive right in. So the notion that you're presenting before us as policy people in the autonomous trucking industry is down the highway, the truck will go without a driver. And when we talk about autonomous vehicles, safety is always paramount. So I want each one of you to provide us um, with a response in terms of what you're doing in the respective areas of safety that the public might be concerned about. Um, uh, Chetan, I wanna ask you first about the engineering safety standards. Perhaps you can give us a little bit of information about that. Of course, um, as, as you mentioned, safety is, uh, is such a, um nuanced concept. It's pretty much like the blind man and the elephant. Everybody talks about safety, especially when it comes to autonomous vehicles, and everybody means something else when they talk about safety. Uh, and uh, let me address the, the engineering part of it. The engineering part of safety is broadly uh, divided into two uh, aspects. One is functional safety, which is uh, more uh, inner looking. So how can we make sure that the components, software and hardware components will be built to a level of reliability that in case of a failure, again, in the mechanical failure or software failure, we can ensure safe operation to the extent that the, uh, the truck can come to a, or the system can come to a safe stop. The second part is safety of the intended functionality. And that is a little bit more outward facing that involves uh, the system's reactions to what's happening around itself, what's happening in the world. And that is, uh, at times a little bit more challenging because uh, even uh, for the group here that we are focusing on the highway uh, operations and highways are a little bit more structured, less chaotic compared to really urban downtown driving scenarios. But nonetheless, the highways have enough chaos to create a lot of problems for self-driving machines. And we need to make sure that we don't just develop the technology, but we actually have quantifiable uh, evidence of the safety and reliability of the technology's capabilities of handling whatever the world might have to throw at the technology. And that is, a, that is a very tricky part. And that's why we all are on the roads testing our systems, but with safety drivers behind the steering wheels as of today. Thank you. Robert, can you tell us a little bit about law enforcement's involvement and safety culture in the autonomous vehicle space? Yeah, happy to, and 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 I'm I'm, I'm proud to say I, I know these companies very well. Uh, even though we're you know competitors, we have a, a very good open dialogue with each other, and do talk about safety culture a lot, and just and how we deal with our, our law enforcement partners. Uh, special thanks to my my colleague here, Dan. Uh, he's leading the charge at TMC, uh, working hand in glove with CVSA and FMCSA, and and other companies are there, you know, supporting that effort as well. And for those who don't know what CVSA stands for, don't want to be the alphabet soup guy, is, is the uh, Commercial Vehicle Safety Association. So they represent all the state, um, you know, state troopers out there, uh, highway patrol, uh, and set standards like inspections. And so we're working with them uh, so they get to understand the technology, what it is, what it's not, and how does our vehicle in the relative near future with no driver in there communicate with them and let them know that, that, it, it, that it's operating safely and efficiently. And then from a safety culture perspective, that goes, as Dan mentioned, all of our companies, we're out there on the roads every single day. Uh, we drive next to our friends and family. You know, for us, it's, it's bookended between Phoenix and, and Dallas is kind of our, our operation and, and you know, along the I-10. We're, we're in Tucson, Arizona is, is our primary facility along with one in Dallas. And you know, it starts with our hiring practices, you know, experienced CDL holders, um, you know, having a, we call them safety engineers, some people call them right seats, you know, um, you know, monitoring the system on all autonomous missions and, and you know, constant training, um, a constant open dialogue with each other, uh, learning from our driver community. Our, our drivers average the age, uh, average experience is anywhere between 20 to 30 years of, of driving experience. So uh, it, it goes to its core because we understand not just from a too simple perspective, but the whole industry perspective. 
we have to have good actors. We are out there on the roads, uh, like I said, every day, you know, hauling freight and um, next to our friends and family. And we understand, that, you know, one bad accident, one bad mistake or pushing something that, that shouldn't be pushed uh, could set not just too simple back, but the whole industry back. And, you know, we take that very seriously uh, from, a, from a, a safety culture perspective. Those are important concerns. Thank you for sharing that. Um, you know, you mentioned, Robert, a little bit about inspections. And Dan, I'm wondering if you can provide us some further information about safety and, and when it comes to inspections of these vehicles. Sure. Um, so first, I, I do want to just, you know, echo what Chetan and, and Robert said and, and how important safety is to Kodiak and and at least to to hopefully my knowledge of everybody in the industry. And I think that's somewhat of a, a misconception about this technology is, is I think there is a, some a sense, at least in the public imagination that, you know, we're, we're all going to kind of like give our, our vehicles a driver's test and then just, you know, just do it and be legends. Um, and, you know, that's not the case at all. I mean, I think the, the, a lot of the work, maybe even most of the work is, is around how do you actually construct uh, a really airtight mathematical argument that these vehicles are safe and and you know we don't plan and I think the consistent view across the industry is don't plan on on operating driverlessly until we can we can make that argument that we're, we're safer than a human um, I think one of the things that sort of differentiates trucks that, that perhaps a lot of folks don't don't give a lot of thought to is that trucking is already a, a pretty highly regulated industry that um, state and local officials as well as the the Federal Motor Carrier Safety Administration, that's part of um, the U.S. Department of Transportation are really sort of have the responsibility of making sure that trucks are operating safely, they're in good working order, that drivers are, you know, following the rules, getting adequate rest. Um, there's a law called hours of service that says basically a driver can only drive for 11 hours a day out of a 14-hour work day. Um, so to some extent, this, this makes our lives maybe a little bit easier because there's already um, already a, a great sort of regulatory structure in, in place around at least certain parts of safety. Um, and it's more a matter of finding the ways to sort of slot self-driving automated trucks into those policies and create something new. So as Robert mentioned, um, I'm working, I, I chair a task force of the American Trucking Association, though I think um, Robert and Monica have been very involved in this as well. And, and we're sort of all working as a team um, working with with CVSA and state highway patrols and FMCSA to develop um, processes to sort of um, include self-driving trucks into the existing safety regulations that make sure things like you know trucks brakes are working they're in good condition everything is the vehicles are, are working the way they should and I think um, you know we've really seen a lot of support from from law enforcement and from industry in, in, in having this because they see such an opportunity to improve safety. And instead of having, you know, uh, sort of seeing maybe, you know, seeing trucks driving by, maybe pulling them into a way station and giving them a once over, they really see an opportunity to get really granular information and understand, you know, exactly what's happening on these trucks and, and hopefully raise the level of safety and the, the level of, of how well the trucks are maintained really across America's trucking fleet. Um, so I think it's a, you know, a really interesting opportunity and, and we've really seen a lot of, um, a lot of support and it's really important to, that we work together to get this right. Thank you, Dan. That was a thorough explanation and certainly gives us some comfort when we know that kind of level of inspection is taking place. Monica, driver training is still a critical component here. So why don't you jump in and give us a perspective on driver training? Sure. So as everyone's mentioned at this time, all US automated truck manufacturers or developers still have test drivers in the cab as that ultimate backstop on safety. And they carry a commercial driver's license, of course, um, but that's not enough. As Dan mentioned, the trucking industry is already heavy, heavily regulated, but we're looking for ways to elevate safety within the industry and driver training is no exception. Um, the risks are so high that we hold our drivers to a correlating bar. And at Embark, we've formed our driver training program around AVSC guidelines. AVSC is the Automated Vehicle Safety Consortium. Um, and their guidelines start with the hiring process that Robert mentioned. That might mean making sure there's no criminal record 
or that they've never had any incidents in previous um, jobs related to their driving. Um, it then evolves to things like in-depth classroom and test track testing, evaluating different scenarios that could come up like a cow in the road or something related to the ADS and just learning how to interact with the right seat operators. A lot of our test drivers have also been trained as right seat operators so that they know the ins and outs of, of what's going on at, at both levels. And then the guidelines endure to things like continued education and assessment, as well as things like driver monitoring, making sure um, that the eyes are on the road and the phones are stowed away. Um, any accident by any AV truck company or really AV company as a whole would set the entire industry back. And so that peer pressure is not just present, it's, it's existential and at the top of minds for all of our operations teams. Thank you. Well, the whole point of this is what can autonomous vehicles do for us as a society in general? What are the, what are the public benefits? Uh, I'm gonna turn it to you, Dan, and tell us for the general public, um, if all of you are successful and, and you have your autonomous vehicles running widespread on the road, what are the benefits for us? Sure. Um, so I, I think there are going to be a ton of benefits of this technology. And, and I think, um, I mean, maybe I'm exaggerating a little bit, but I think once people get used to them, people are actually really going to gonna like self-driving trucks. Um, as, you know, as I think we've mentioned um, a couple times at this point, the, the most important benefit is safety. And roughly four to 5,000 Americans die every year in accidents with long haul trucks. Um, truck driving is the most dangerous job that any Americans do um, with any, in any sort of numbers. I think the only things that are higher, are like, you know, the, what, what was deadliest catch style fishing and, you know, certain logging jobs, which are not exactly you know, something that, that a lot of people are engaged in. Um, and, you know, I think anything we can do to, to reduce th those risks is incredibly important and, and I think is, is really going to be um, pretty transformative for people. But I think beyond safety, there are going to be a lot of benefits as well. I think um, self-driving trucks are, are, are going to basically make the roads better and, and, and safer for everybody. Um, our trucks are going to, you know, stay in the right lane for the most part. They're, you know, they're not going to do anything weird. They're not going to be cutting people off. They're going to stay at the speed limit. Um, you know, they're not going to text and drive. They're not going to drive drowsy. They're not going to drive drunk. Um, and so they're going to be, they're going to be pretty boring. In fact, they already are pretty boring. I always joke, um, on my first day on the job, um, it's not a joke. It's actually true. I like scheduled uh, my whole afternoon for a test drive. Um, and they said, okay, we're going to go out for like a half an hour loop around, you know, around the office. And I said, half an hour? No, like, this is like very exciting. So we, we drive out to the highway and they push play. And then about 45 seconds in, like, okay, I get this. The thing drives itself. Um, and start like heading, looking around, like, it's cool. Can we take the next exit? You know, if not, all right, we'll do all 30 minutes. Um, you know, so I, I think people will, will sort of feel that on the roads. Um, I think there are going to be a lot of other benefits. I think we'll be able to reduce congestion. The trucks don't care if it's five in the morning or five in the afternoon. So, you know, we're not going to be driving on the beltway at rush hour, driving everybody insane. And not that we're in DC quite yet, you know, um, we need places with better snow removal before, before that happens. Um, you know, and, and I think part of that means that, that you'll actually, people will see fewer trucks on the road because they'll be sort of scheduled that way. Um, in terms of less tangible benefits, I think the most important is going to be environmental. Um, we, we see about a 10% improvement in fuel efficiency when our system is running um, in autonomous mode versus manual driving. I think Robert and, and Too Simple have done some, some research that shows very similar results um, with the University of California. Um, that's a huge amount of diesel fuel across America's trucking fleet. Um, and I think the, the last thing is that they're, they're just going to be a lot more efficient, you know, as you mentioned, being able to get from coast to coast in sort of two, two and a half, three days, instead of four to six days is a huge deal. It's a huge deal for businesses across the country, for California farmers and, you know, mid, Midwestern dairy farmers and having that kind of 
sort of increased logistics capacity um, could be really transformative. So, um, you know, I think, I think there are going to be a lot of benefits. It's one of those things um, where the benefits are, are so big and so dispersed that maybe you, you sort of don't believe it. Um, I have a friend who, who worked in alternative energy who said that people didn't like believe or understand the numbers around LED conversions because, you know, saving 80% on, on lighting bills across the entire country was such a big number that people just didn't process it and thought you were lying. And I think, I think we're talking about a, a similar but much larger effect with, with autonomous trucks. It certainly is exciting. Thank you, Dan. I think one of the things that we have to face is the regulatory community, right? So I'll, I'll address the next question um, to you, Monica. We're getting ready to seat a new Congress. Um, where are we with federal legislation regarding autonomous trucks in specific? Um, and is there something that you're hoping to see from any potential legislation? Sure, it's a great question and, and one that generates a lot of buzz. I think the answer lies in USDOT's 2018 report, commonly referred to as AV 3.0. In that report, they said that no new regulation or legislation was required for automated commercial motor vehicles to hit the road, and that remains true today. Um, a highway infrastructure bill would certainly help all road users, and while we would love a comprehensive bill on AVs, we, we certainly don't need to be included in something like AV Start, et cetera, to um, continue in our development. That being said, there are certainly things that could um, clarify some confusion and give us more certainty. For example, we are anxiously awaiting FMCSA's notice of proposed rulemaking um, about safe integration of ADS into commercial motor vehicles. We could also use a bit more leadership from um, at the federal level to reinforce that interstate trucking is regulated at the federal level because of its intricate relationship to interstate commerce and to discourage and in any way possible um, remove the need for states to interfere with that regulation while trying to inadvertently regulate a broader group of AVs. Thank you, Monica. And you bring up a good point about um, state um, intervention, so to speak, when it comes to the regulatory environment for autonomous vehicles, but specifically for trucks. Um, Chetan, uh, we know that there's some federal regulation percolating, but what do you see at the state level? And is there a possible impact on your ability as you are mapping and testing to travel from one state to the other? Uh, when we are uh, looking for opportunities to test our technology, of course, we are following a Swiss cheese model. We look at the states with supporting legislative framework. We look at supporting weather, snow removal, as Dan said, and of course, supporting freight density. So a bunch of different combination has to come together. From a state support point of view, in terms of legislation, uh, we are, what we are seeing is a great, great momentum. So uh, just in the last year, more states have passed uh, supporting legislation than the previous 10 years combined. So we are seeing the proverbial hockey stick momentum in the, in the state's um, activities regarding regulating or supporting the, the AV deployment and testing. Uh, having said that, uh, what we are also seeing is a little bit of a patchwork. Uh, every state has a different way of regulating uh, different types of autonomy. And uh, while there seems to be some, some patterns emerging as we move forward, different states are looking and copying from each other and replicating what, uh, what protocol is working and improving what protocol is not working. Uh, there is a little bit of a dis, uh, disconnect and lack of coherency. And uh, as, as Monica was saying, I think right now we have the, the, the building blocks, the foundation, enough material, enough awareness at the state level that we, could, we are getting to a point where we can use a little bit more federal leadership in, for, in, to unify these, not to invent or not to come up with completely new legislation, but to unify the existing um, efforts. And uh, as a player in the field, 
uh, what we are doing is we are working very, very closely with uh, all the states that, of course, we are uh, operating in, we are testing in, and sometimes we are even uh, playing a little role in cross-pollinization. So, uh, one particular example is that very recently we've done a, uh, a, a pilot uh, program in Oregon and Idaho. Oregon had supporting legislation, but Idaho did not. But uh, our home state, Pennsylvania, has a, a very thorough uh, protocol for authorizing deployment of autonomous vehicles and uh, platooning applications. So we basically facilitated a conversation. And as a result, now Idaho has a legislation. Now Idaho has a protocol that not just us, but anyone else can actually go and operate there. So this is a snowball effect. Uh, we are very happy with the, the, the way things are today, but uh, we also acknowledge that there is a lot more uh, to be done, especially towards unification. No, thank you. That's very interesting. And I, and I like the idea of, um, you call it the snowball effect, but, but really when one state is learning from another state and we can share some of those lessons as you all are testing on our roadways, I think it will make this um, much better by the time we get to widespread use. I want to turn a little bit to um, general impacts on the community. And I'll start with um, Robert and, uh, and Chetan on my understanding that a couple of you are doing food bank deliveries. Um, certainly in COVID times, this seems as important work, but kind of want to understand how you got there and maybe you could tell us a little bit more uh, about it. Yeah, thank you, Salika. This is, a, this is a kind of like what Dan was talking about earlier, like the kind of the, the downstream un unintended positive consequences that we could see from this type of technology. And I'm not going to lie, I'd like to take complete, you know, ownership of this, but a couple of years ago, actually right about this time around Thanksgiving, we were looking for a good team building, you know, exercise out in Tucson, uh, give back to the community, you know, do some good, right? So we uh, were like, said, so, oh, let's donate some food to the local food bank, we'll drive it autonomously, and then, you know, work in the afternoon uh, at the food bank, you know, put together uh, meals around for Thanksgiving. And uh, so we did that, and then we, I started talking to the Arizona food banks, and and, I, and they were talking about how transportation is one of their biggest pain points. Um, obviously fresh food is a, a universal right for all of us, right? You know, we need to eat fresh, nutritious food uh, to better our bodies and make us healthy. Sleek, I love your, your, your talking points around this. It's a holistic view of, of the person from a government uh, policy perspective. But, you know, one, uh, 100 and, let me get the stat right. Uh, $161 billion of food is wasted every year in the United States. And 14% of that never gets to your grocery store. And that is usually related to a transportation issue. Case in point, we do, a, we do loads for the Arizona Food Bank, um, especially after, during COVID, we did pro bono loads, uh, but we continue to do uh, daily runs uh, at a discounted rate for our local food bank as well. But they'll get a, a donation of lettuce out of Yuma and uh, obviously, the the farmer wanted to sell that to market and, and couldn't get a uh, couldn't get the market, and, and that needs to get to get to Texas, get up to New Jersey, uh, get around the get around the country because they work with Feeding America and they do a lot of food balancing between food banks. And obviously, that that lettuce is already kind of at the edge because that farmer was holding out, hopefully to sell it, uh, but they donated it. So you, the food bank has to pay you know premium in, when capacity is incredibly tight during growing seasons and peak seasons. Um, you know, team drivings, rates that go through the roof, and every dollar that they have to spend in transportation is a one less dollar to, to meet um, their community that is uh, food insecure. So it, it, we're hopeful that, you know, reliable capacity is going to be a key uh, of autonomous trucks because you do no longer have the hours of service, you no longer have the pinch point or the choke point uh, of the driver shortage within this, uh, within this community. So you're really going to be able to open the fire hose, uh, not just for food banks, but even for the WalMarts of the world. We all bought, you know, strawberries. You're so excited, and by the time you get them home the next day, you got mold on them. You know, so getting an extra shelf life around that. You know, so I think there's so many great things from a carbon perspective. You know, not wasting food and obviously food insecurity. There, it is a, it is. I'd, I'd say probably the most interesting vertical for me uh, when it comes to autonomous trucks. Everyone talks about e-commerce, but food is so important is the lifeblood of our country and, and the amount of you know, food wasted and the, the carbon that goes into it. I mean, there's just so many ESG components to it. Um, yeah, I just 
it's a it's an exciting space to be in. And uh, that I'll throw to my buddy Chad. Well, thank you so much, Robert. I, Robert covered uh, the the broader perspective really really well. So I'm gonna just offer a few more practical, more 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 localized nuggets. Uh, we first started uh, working with the Pittsburgh Food Bank in the early days of the pandemic, and that just proved once again how distressed the supply chain for food is, and uh, how constantly under pressure, not just monetary, but even getting access to the capacity to actually do the deliveries, uh, how uh, constantly under pressure the food banks are. And uh, more recently, uh, we were fortunate enough to be a part of a multi-state uh, demonstration with participation from Smart Belt Coalition, consisting of Pennsylvania, Ohio, and Michigan. That was for a regulatory exercise, effectively trying to understand how states are thinking differently. Can we unify them? Can we at least uh, get, uh, get all parties to an agreement so that multi-state operation of autonomous driving is possible? But as part of that exercise, we also uh, had the chance to uh, continue collaborating with the, the food banks. And this time, we actually uh, delivered some food from Pittsburgh Food Bank first to uh, the food bank in Ohio and then to a food bank in Michigan. So a multi-state food swap, uh, which was a, a very important part of, again, their supply chain operations. And they are constantly uh, challenged uh, to, to make that happen. Uh, I agree with Robert, food is the literally the, the flesh and bone of our, our existence and is uh, oftentimes overlooked uh, when it comes to the, the inefficiencies, the capacity problems and basic uh, lack of shortcomings of the existing supply chain. And uh, autonomy in a lot of different forms, including what Locomation is doing, including what Two Simple Embark and Atoliac are doing, is going to make it uh, much better for all the stakeholders. No, thank you both. I, uh, as Robert said, this is one of my primary areas of lecturing is the understanding of what I call the political economy of autonomous vehicles, addressing the societal needs through a regulatory or a political legislative environment, food, healthcare, and good jobs all require transportation. And, um, and what you're doing with the food banks is, is just really important work. Um, I, so I just touched on jobs and so I'm gonna turn to that. I think it's something that all of you could probably touch on. We know that there's a lot of rhetoric around the impact of autonomous vehicles in general. If you could take away a delivery job or um, you know, take away people's ability to work and but we know also in the background, as I started at the beginning of this conversation, there are fewer and fewer people who are going into the industry of a professional truck driver. And um, numbers uh, in terms of how you get paid and the ability to drive, coupled with the hours of service that Dan talked about, um, issues of safety. I just want to know where you all stand when it comes to whether you believe um, truck driving jobs will be impacted by widespread use of autonomous vehicles. I'll start with um, with Monica, and then we can go back to you, Chetan, and then Robert and Dan. Monica? Yeah, the over the last nine months, we've all become intimately familiar with the feeling of uncertainty. And so it's really easy to relate to concerns around uncertainty of long haul trucking jobs. Um, and it's on us as an industry to educate and collaborate with labor unions like the Teamsters and other labor voices. And those conversations are happening. We, uh, the line of communication always has been and always will be open with those groups. Um, and as we go into those conversations, it's important that we give appropriate weight to the efficiency and safety benefits of this technology and that we go into it with a recognition of what this technology actually is. Um, it's a whole lot more like the internet than the iPhone. It's not gonna be on every street corner one random Friday. It's gonna be like the internet, obscure at first, a few applications and gradually expanding to change the way we think about the transportation industry or our supply chains like Robert and Satin talked about with GHG emissions and agricultural spoilage. Um, I think the 
the biggest point of going into those labor conversations is um, that when you really get into the nitty gritty of the numbers and what the technology actually is, um, it, it's not as obstructionist as some headlines may make it out to be. Thank you. Does anybody have anything else to add in the area of labor force? Uh, I mean, I, I, I agree with Monica. I, I think in general, uh, the, the timelines and the scales are largely uh, misperceived. This is not a, a next Monday problem. This is a multi-generational problem. Even if we want it to, to make that happen, because we are all in the business of developing the technology and eventually benefiting from that, te that technology, but there's a natural uh, cadence, the natural pace of uh, doing that. Uh, just a random fact, if we stop doing everything we are doing today and start shipping completely autonomous trucks tomorrow, it's going to take about 20 years to replace every single truck with an autonomous truck. And we all know that we are far away from being in that state. So it, it is not a, the time scale is really, really long. And uh, the deployment scale is also uh, very, very uh, different. There are about 4 million class A trucks just in the United States today. And I believe any of us, that's definitely for uh, true for locomotion, we are aiming to uh, be able to deploy a couple of tens of thousands of trucks within the next decade or so. And we will call ourselves wildly successful if we can actually execute on this. And we will still be less than 1% maybe of the, the total number of trucks. So it's going to happen for sure. It's going to take longer than most people give it credit for. That's also for sure. And I don't think any single driver will actually today will lose their jobs to, to an autonomous truck. And I'll just chime in. I, again, great, great conversation. Um, and I agree with all of the uh, my colleagues and, and, uh, and their assessments. But I mean, I was just on a, 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 a listening in on a panel, I should say, uh, from some 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 of the largest private carriers in this country, and they're talking about you know the the throughput that they have to have right now is is absolutely incredible. You know, not to mention with COVID closing down DOTs. So it's difficult for people to actually get licenses as CDL holders. Um, the drug clearing house uh, is rightfully, you know, from a safety perspective, driving out you know, drivers. So that throughput coming in. And, and you know, from a too civil perspective, we decided to kind of take this head on. Uh, we, what we partnered with our local community college, Puma Community College and their truck driving school, creating a uh, four CDL holders an autonomous certificate program to become a test driver at Too Simple or Embark or Kodiak, and and we understand it's it's only one you know kind of program, but we're hoping it can be a, a, a point of for folks that want to future proof themselves, want to be a part of a tech company. Uh, we're pretty fun to work for, and I'm sure my uh, my colleagues would, would agree that they're pretty fun to work for. Uh, great benefits, you know, um, attract uh, uh, attractive life life work life balance where they're home every night. And that's where we're hoping, you know, the future of autonomous trucks will be. You know, we'll take that middle mile portion of, of the route. Uh, and you, if you talk to the large carriers, they can recruit pretty well and most importantly retain um, uh, drivers on a, on a regional or local pickup and delivery. Some of the turnover on, on long haul is over 150%. That means they have to recruit over 150%. So that's a lot of GNA costs. So again, I agree with my colleagues that one, this, the timelines won't displace people. But two, we, we'd like as an industry, and even as too simple, think to, to create different paths, to recruit maybe, uh, you know, uh, new people in the industry. The trucking industry, only 6% are women. That's, a, that's atrocious. You know, you're, you have a 50, over 50% of the population, you have 6%, you know, are women in, in the industry. And so how can this technology, you know, attract, you know, a more diverse and, and more, you know, at least, I even call it a gender balance, but at least, you know, some, some, um, you know, uh, equity uh, in our space, I think is important, so. You know, you were speaking my, my tune when you talk about equity and transportation, because that's a big issue. And I think that the ability to, to be home at the end of the day will help to bridge that gap between that 6% and the 50% of the population. Dan, do you want to add anything on this subject? I don't have much to add. I think I think all of those are great answers. Um, I think you know just to sort of highlight what what we started with. Um, you know, much of the industry has this middle mile model where we're 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 still sort of, you know, planning on working with um, local first and last mile drivers. And in fact, that that means we'll increase the amount of demand for those kinds of drivers and create 
those kinds of jobs. I mean, I'm always struck by, look, there, there are lots and lots of people, hundreds of thousands of people who love being long haul truck drivers. I think the, the population of long haul truck drivers is around 300,000 in the US. Um, and as you said, the average age is 55. There are people who've, who've grown up doing this and they love doing it. But those kinds of people are, are um, you know, less and less common. It's just not not how we live anymore as a country um, with, you know, dad, because again, it's 90, 93, 94% men gone for weeks and weeks at a time um, and sending a check home. And, and that's sort of dad's job. That's just not our society. And, you know, uh, you can argue about whether that's a good thing or a bad thing. I think most people would think it's a good thing. I mean, I'm struck by, you know, one of something one of our drivers said to me, which was, you know, I didn't mind a week or two away from the family, but when it got to two, three months without seeing the kids, it was it got it was pretty hard. Um, you know, and that's 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 a real challenge, um, and it's a real human problem. Um, so, you know, I also think we're to some extent we're talking about shifting jobs rather than. Um, you know, rather than just sort of eliminating them, there's going to be a lot of p new jobs created, technician jobs, maintenance jobs, logistics jobs, um, you know, sort of moving up the value chain and, and, and higher skill jobs, but um, great jobs for even for today's truckers. I mean, any, any trucker has had the experience of, you know, of having to fix something small on their truck and understands at least a little bit about how they work and having that opportunity to move into either a daily deri delivery driver or, you know, move up and be, do some tech technical work and, and actually work on the trucks, I think is a fantastic opportunity. No, thank you. I want to ask a, a, a couple of quick questions because I want to get to some audience questions as well. But when it comes to infrastructure, um, whether or not you think we have the ability to handle widespread use or um, if we need to have 5G in order to get there, or do we need a truck lane? So I'll ask um, Chetan to weigh in on whether or not he thinks we currently have the infrastructure to handle widespread use. As long as we fix the potholes and we paint the lane markings, I think uh, that's we are very low maintenance. That's, that's the extent of infra infrastructure requirements we have. Of course, in an ideal universe, having a dedicated truck lane would have been very nice, but we don't think it's practical. And we don't think that's absolutely necessary before we can actually start deploying the technology. So the infrastructure and 5G, we don't need 5G. I'm sure that 5G will play a role and it will help and it will, uh, it will contribute, but it's not an absolute necessary uh, requirement. Um, do all of you feel that way about 5G? Yeah, I think he hit the, he hit the nail on the head. Um, if any of us were to develop tech that relied on designated lanes or even V to X, our technology would be virtually worthless when it's ready and those billions of billions of dollars haven't been invested in that technology. Um, in reality, like Chetan said, what's good for human drivers is good for AVs. Clear lane lines allow perception to pick up um, where they're supposed to be driving. Fixing potholes allows for sensor protection and proper calibration. Um, a lot of this also comes out in the state and federal policy work we do. Um, it's, it's a common headline that you see that's not usually brought up by the ADS developers. But the more we can emphasize that what's good for human drivers is good for AVs, the less money is invested in technology that we ultimately don't need and instead invested in something that benefits all road users. Thank you. And I'll, I'll chime in on the kind of the connectivity 5G debate. And, and actually, it was, it, it's worthwhile uh, to note, we actually, uh, Goodyear announced a partnership with us today on a, on a tire wear study and a connectivity, you know, study, you know, what, you know, from trailer to, to, to steering tires, how do, how do tires communicate to our vehicle and how, and how hopefully, you know, autonomy benefits, you know, tire wear and, and, uh, and, and, and speaking, you know, from a connected vehicle architecture. And so I don't want to downplay the importance of connected vehicles and, 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 and the transparency that they'll provide, the safety components they'll provide. But I also want to like squ completely squash the idea that 
You know, a lot of people think of connected vehicles and, you know, remote operators of like someone sitting here like yeah, my computer screen and I'm driving the truck behind me, you know, uh, from a joystick perspective. And, you know, and, and, and I love my LTE providers, you know, AT&T, Verizon, T-Mobile, you're all out there. And they, they do use us as a talking point a lot. You know, we have to, you know, have to have uh, 5G for autonomous vehicles. And as Chet mentioned, it's great, but we also know, you know, when it comes to timelines and, and rollout plans, 5G is going to be a long time, especially for our use case. We're not going to be driving around in downtown Phoenix and downtown DC. We're in West Texas. <laughs> and so unless, uh, you know, Verizon, ATT, and T-Mobile want to saturate, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars in building out West Texas's 5G strategy, uh, I think we'll be waiting a long time uh, for that type of technology. But so the one hand connectivity, thumbs up, uh, absolutely, completely, you know, but, you know, we, we're not gated by that 5G deployment. When we talk about um, sort of the new frontier, we see Governor Newsom with his executive order in California on electric vehicles. Um, is there any role um, electrification or alternative fuels play in the um, autonomous vehicle industry? And any of you could take that. Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to take that. Um, you know, you talk to our controls engineer, uh, Dr. Arta Kirk, and he, He's like, yeah, give it to me. You know, he loves uh, from a controls perspective what a, a electric powertrain can do. But again, we're also realists. Uh, we're big fans of, you know, Penske's doing some great stuff on uh, local pickup and delivery with uh, the e Cascadia. Um, you know, but all of us are, we're talking about long haul middle mile truck, which is probably the last mode that will go, you know, electric just based on the use case. It's all about uptime for what we do. Um, you know, and, and electric vehicles aren't great for that, but they're all, but it doesn't mean we're against electric. It's just, you know, the business use case doesn't necessarily match the business use case for electric um, powertrains. Now, you know, everyone, you know, hydrogen's hot right now. Uh, Cummins and Navistar just announced a partnership. Uh, there's a bunch of startups, uh, you know, but again, that also requires infrastructure as well. So I think, uh, especially for from Too Simple, and I would guess most of the industry that that are focused on long haul, that it, the traditional internal combustion engine is, is probably the, the first you know, scale you'll see in this technology uh, from a level four perspective. Any of you want to weigh in on that? Yeah, I, 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 would, I would echo that. I think that the day that there are, again, the, the, the engineering for reasons that are above all of our heads, except for maybe Chaitin's, um, the engineering to put an autonomy system on top of an electric truck is sim much simpler than a diesel truck. So the day that electric long haul trucks exist, we will love to um, to use them. The, the challenge is that they they simply don't exist um, at this point, and and that is that is a genuine problem. Um, so, but I do think you know for for middle mile models, as, as Robert said, you know we'll probably start to see electrification on on first and last mile, um, and and to some extent already have, and I think I think that's where there's there may be a lot of um, a lot of opportunities to do things like you know building charging stations and and switching points um, near each other or you know co-locating and things like that um, to to really you know start building the the infrastructure we need to, um, to 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 start taking as much carbon as possible out of the system. Well, Mr. Engineer. Uh, I'm giving you an opportunity to weigh in because this is really, this is you. I, 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 Sorry for jumping on your line here. <laughs> no, I think, uh, I think my colleagues really, really covered it well. That again, uh, just like this dedicated truck lanes and ubiquitous 5G coverage, it would have been great to have uh, fully electric long haul trucks so that you could actually uh, add even more value. They simply don't exist today. Our, uh, near-term deployment uh, concept of operations will probably uh, start utilizing the internal combustion engines. But just like my colleagues, we are actually looking into every opportunity to uh, see how uh, alternate uh, powertrains, alternate uh, fuel systems, etc., can be integrated into autonomy and can be deployed whenever and however possible. Is the industry going to be doing something to address emissions? If that's a concern, and and you know, what? 
Yes, I, uh, I think so. I mean, I'm jumping in because that actually connects to what we are doing uh, since we are starting with, uh, with autonomous convoying. There is a, a on top of uh, the fuel savings and the wear and tear reduction that autonomous driving brings. We uh, also observe about eight percent on average uh, fuel savings just from platooning effect uh, with the, with the trucks. And it might uh, look like a single digit number. I mean, it's, it's a number, but it's, it might not sound that impressive. But at the scale that we are talking about, the total number of miles these trucks are driving and how horrible they are when it comes to mileage, when it comes to their MPG numbers, it adds up very, very fast. And it actually uh, turns into something significant. We are at, at locomotion, we are looking at over uh, 40 tons uh, of uh, reduction in the annual CO2 emissions uh, per convoy uh, for a medium, even a, for a medium sized fleet that's millions and millions, tens of millions of tons of uh, uh, CO2 reduction. Thank you. We do have a question about um, workforce. And um, I, I guess what the, the questioner is asking um, from a workforce perspective, are there particular skills that would be useful for cross training to recur for people sort of to move from one seat to the next? Can I jump in again? Since <laughs> I was the last one to talk. Um, so we see, uh, again, like from, from a company point of view, we actually see it as an evolution rather than just like a, a overnight revolution point of view. We see a role in uh, the human drivers for a long time, even in the long haul routes because of our convoy approach. We will, all, we will have a human driver at the, uh, in the lead position at the, uh, the front of the, the convoy for a long time. And we, uh, on top of the traditional driving job that exists today, we see it as a, 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 a little bit more of an advanced skill, extra training, a little bit more, more of a premium job. That is maybe a, a good analog is the, the, uh, the today's airline pilots. Uh, they will be still in charge. They will be making the high level decisions, but they will be a little bit more trained and they will be more aware around the, the entire contraption that they are in charge of. Uh, so, uh, of course, that means extra curriculum. That means at least this additional piece of the curriculum. And um, I'm sure my colleagues are in, in the same boat, but we are in, in touch with several uh, uh, institutions currently handling the driver training to look for opportunities uh, in, in curriculum expansion, what extra um, areas that uh, that needs to be covered. Who is going to come up with that curriculum? What are we? How are we going to inject what we are learning uh, while developing and testing this technology? How are we going to close that loop and feed that information back to the training system? Uh, we we are in several discussions like that. It's a long way, but making some progress. Thank you. And as I look, we are literally. We have talked ourselves to out of time, but I want to give each of you an opportunity to just share what you're excited about in the area of autonomous vehicles and autonomous trucking. So, Chaitan, uh, you're you're still up. I'll give you what what are you excited okay. about? I'm gonna I'm gonna make it very short and sweet. Uh, th this whole endeavor is about creating value, and. When we create value, that value is going to be divided among all the stakeholders this way and that way. Of course, we need to be careful in, in being fair and in being uh, equal opportunity when, when it comes to share the wealth, but it's all about creating value. It's all about uh, making the world a better place. To, I'm going to be cheesy. Uh, and that's, uh, that is extremely exciting, being a part of that. Dan? Um, sure, I mean, I think, you know, I, I talked a lot about all the, the benefits, but I think it's it's just incredibly exciting. Sleek, as you started off us off with, is basically everything that any of us uses every day travels on a truck. It's incredibly important. And having the the opportunity to really change um, sort of our, our most fundamental industry um, and make it safer, more efficient, and, and greener is just really exciting. Thank you. Monica? Yeah, I think we've talked a lot about how trucking is often the overlooked backbone or vertebrae of our economy and we don't count the meals or birthday presents delivered or ballet recitals missed by our drivers. 
Um, I'm really excited for this industry to be able to tout some big wins like lives saved or GHG emissions reduced. Um, I think when you take away a lot of the glitz and glam that's surrounding our transportation industry right now, you uncover some even more exciting real world implications. Fantastic. And Robert, again, not, not least, but in this time last. Again, incredibly excited about the technology where it's going to be over the next few years. But, you know, as we are in peak season and with COVID, it's been perpetual peak season. You know, next time, you know, you see your UPS driver, you know, drop off that, that package. Hopefully it's an essential good that you ordered, you know, you know, say thank you. And and because of what they do is a is a very difficult job. And Dan, you know, said from a safety perspective, from a work-life balance perspective, you know, and, and, and that's why I'm always been a big proponent of, you know, having an open dialogue with our, our drivers because this is how they feed their families and I get the anxiety around, you know, when you see the headlines or 60 minutes or something like that, you know, coming out. But, you know, it's going to be working together, um, all of us uh, and our government, you know, to create, you know, this technology because it's something we, we need for our supply chain. So I can't forget, thank you guys enough. My colleagues and Salika, this has been great. Thank you all. I, I want to um, just sort of echo the sentiment that I started with. Uh, trucking is the backbone of our nation. Um, trucking and transportation is the key to good jobs, health care, and good food. And all the things that you do are important to getting us to the place where we know that we won't have distracted driving and we won't have people's eyes off of the road. We'll be safer and we'll be a country where our goods are traveling in a much more environmentally uh, better manner and we're meeting the needs of the nation. So thank you all very much and I wish you a great afternoon. Take care. Thanks. Bye.